I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. This is from 2 Timothy, the last chapter of the last epistle that the Apostle Paul ever wrote before going to his execution. And in these last words of his, the Apostle delivers an imperative not only to young Timothy as he struggles to lead the church at Ephesus, but an imperative that echoes down all succeeding generations of pastors and preachers yet to come. An imperative, a solemn charge, that is just as true for those of us in the pulpits of contemporary Canada as it was to be in the pulpits of the first century church. And it is this. Preach the word. This is to be done in season and out of season. It is to be done, that is to mean, when it's easy and the words are easily received and the culture is appreciative and accepting. It is also to be done with the exact same enthusiasm, with the exact same strength of mission, when things are out of season, when it is difficult, when the culture is not receptive, when it doesn't seem to be producing so much fruit. Now it's generally taken to mean, preach the word, can be taken in two ways. The first is general. Generally, the man of God, the man called to occupy a pulpit, is to preach the entirety of the biblical canon. That is everything from Genesis 1-1 to the end of the Revelation. You preach it all. You don't camp on anything. You don't repeat your favorites. Neither do you get to skip over anything that makes you or anyone else uncomfortable. You, uh, you preach it all. You preach it all. Now, while that is certainly true, the term that Paul employs in, if you go into the Greek manuscripts, the term he uses here for word has a more specific meaning as well. And it specifically can be applied to the concept of doctrine particularly that which concerns the attainment of salvation through Christ. And that is why in the verses that immediately follow that, he goes on to talk more about doctrine. And he laments a sad truth to Timothy, that a time is coming, very soon, a time is coming when men and women will neither listen to nor tolerate any such sound teaching. And these will, as we looked at last week, Yes, in a way, in a very general way, this could be applied to people outside the church. But more specifically, what he's talking about are the people inside the church. A time is coming very soon when people will start to drift away from the sound doctrine inside the church and they will start to look for narratives and myths that scratch their itching ears. That is, there will be things that they want to hear, falsehoods, they will want to hear those affirmed. And if you're preaching here, Timothy, true doctrine, biblical doctrine, you're preaching the word of God, just know some people are eventually going to, going to fade away. And yet, he is nonetheless to endure all such defections, all such cultural sways and impediments. Timothy is here to focus on fulfilling a ministry. How does he do that? Through preaching the word of God. And interestingly, if he does that, verse 2, if he preaches the word, just even looking at the text, you see that that comes first, everything else comes second. If he does that, if he continually preaches sound doctrine, which is what the word consists of, he will naturally, verse 5, do the work of an evangelist. Now, last week we looked at this pastoral charge, not only as it applied to Timothy, but as it applied to everyone in, in, the contemporary, in our contemporary setting here in Canada who occupies the pulpit. And I, as often happens, ended up with so much to say that it had to be turned into two messages. Last 
week we looked at primarily the first part of this, the preaching of the word. But this week I'd like to look, finish it up. I had an awful lot to say and share with you about this particular phrase in verse 5, doing the work of an evangelist. We even describe ourselves in our, 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 in our church, right? We are an evangelical church. Well, what does that mean? And are we? Are we all doing the work of an evangelist? Are the ministers who claim to be biblical, are, are they really doing the work of an evangelist? Let's begin with this. Let's, let's actually start on this term, this descriptive term employed here by Paul. Now, it may interest you to know that this term, evangelist, only appears twice in all the New Testament. Uh, three, if you'll allow a plural form. Um, the first time it shows up is in Acts 21, where it is used to describe Philip. Uh, as they're heading to Jerusalem, they stop into the house of Philip the Evangelist, who has four daughters who are all prophetesses. Later in the New Testament, it is, uh, there is a, a plural form of it found in Ephesians 4. At Ephesians 4.11, Paul is describing the various types of men and, and their gifts and the offices that have been gifted for the nourishment and the uh, strengthening of the church. Among those are evangelists. And then finally, back in its singular form, it appears here in this final letter to Timothy. Now, if you employ the Greek word that's used here for evangelist, it, it simply means someone who brings good news. It could apply to anybody and any kind of news. In the biblical context, however, we know that this is referring to someone who brings not just any good news, but the good news. That is, they are gospelizing, is how this breaks down sometimes into a verb. So while it's true to say that the telling of the gospel, that the telling of the good news, that is something that is applied and appointed to all Christians everywhere. And as we've looked at, it's part of the Great Commission. That, that's not just a pastoral commission, that's a Great Commission. It is the job of the church and of everyone in the church to give their testimony, to proclaim the gospel, to let their friends and neighbors and family members know how much they need to come to Christ. While it is something that is the task of the church at large, we also need to recognize that within the church there are those few called to specifically focus on it and to make the proclamation of the gospel, to make the bringing of the good news the heart of their vocational work. Looking up this definition in Strong's Greek, I really like what they have to have um, here. There are there are those called in the church to be, quote, heralds of salvation through Christ, close quote. They're, they're, they're to be like, like the town crier. They're to be the heralds in Christ's great kingdom court with trumpet blast and, and unfurled scroll. They are to stand and give the call and announce loudly, and boldly, and unapologetically. And so to summarize the entirety of, I guess what we could rightly call the Timothean charge here, let me summarize it thusly. Christian ministers are to fulfill their vocational calling from God by announcing the gospel in all seasons and through the vehicle of preaching. It is preaching that is to be at the heart of the minister's ministry. Now, even the most casual of biblical surveys proves this to be true. God has chosen preaching to be the particular way and means through which believers are called. Jesus himself begins his earthly ministry with the proclamation of the gospel, that is, the preaching of the gospel, right? Mark 1, 15. And what is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7? It is not the casual chat on the mount. It's not the enthusiastic pep talk on the mount. It's not the fireside talk by the mount. It is the sermon from the mount. 
Christ is preaching from that mountainside for all to hear. As for his followers, Matthew 10, 27, all that Jesus said is to be repeated from the housetops, that is, loudly, publicly. And what is it that is to be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations? Matthew 24, 14, it is the gospel proclaimed. Now consider the Great Commission. The version in Mark, the Markan version, expressly includes a charge at Mark 16.15 to proclaim the gospel. And that is a statement that has to be taken in addition to the one that we find at the end of Matthew, where we have the rest of the command, make, baptize, and teach disciples. I mean, consider it this way. How do you make the disciples that are to be baptized into the church and then into a lifetime of teaching... How do you even get them unless you proclaim the gospel? Those two things, those two, those two things have to be taken together. Peter confirms in Acts 10.42, God has commanded the gospel to be relayed to the Gentiles through preaching. And of course, we uh, I couldn't go no no survey would be complete without looking at Romans 10. 10, 13 to 17, where Paul makes it quite clear. Let me read a portion of that to you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But, listen to this at 14. How then shall they call on him that they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So to follow this backwards, because Paul actually presents this argument backwards, so let me reverse it into its correct order for you. What Paul is saying is this. Preachers tell the people about the works and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in Christ that they then come to believe. Once they believe, it is Christ that they call out to, and he, as Lord, will save them. So it all begins with preaching. Which is why he sums it up here at Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the man of God is out there proclaiming. He's setting all of this in motion. He's casting that bread on the water and allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work in bringing it to fruition. But he's not just out there giving his opinion. He's not just out there giving a, a pep talk. He is preaching. You are hearing the word of God. So consider again Paul's charge to Timothy. What is he to do primarily? What is the very first thing that Paul says you are to do? It is to preach. It is to preach. It is not as we would hear so often in our contemporary setting, it is not to make community. It is not to find exciting new ways of doing church. It is not to advocate for social justice. It is not to reinvigorate the local neighborhood. It's not even, Timothy, I charge you to live incarnationally among the people of Ephesus. No, it is to preach the word. All other facets of his ministry, including his evangelistic work, flow out of and are dependent upon the act of repeatedly and continuously making the scriptures known. It's all about the scriptures. They are the horse. Everything else is cart. And if the contemporary church is guilty of anything, it is grossly guilty, and has been for decades, of reversing this relationship. Of trying to put incarnational living, and mission, and everything else that a church should do, first, and then preaching time permitting. Worse yet, worse yet, there are churches out there, even today, who just have a cart and no horse whatsoever. 
How are they supposed to get anything done? How are they supposed to go anywhere? Let me posit a related question then this morning. Both church plants and established congregations, as we see here, are called to pursue missional outreach, yes. But can you do any kind of missional outreach with a congregation full of immature Christians? Let me put it, let me, let, let, me, let me boil it down this way. Do babes and milk drinkers know how to make community? Do babes and milk drinkers know how to fight for justice in a world system that lies in the power of the evil one? Can the neighborhood surrounding the church possibly be renewed by those who don't yet confidently exhibit the incarnation of the Savior. See, the preaching has to come first, because it's the preaching of the Word that builds up the maturity of the witness. Among the reasons that Paul made it his unceasing goal to see the churches come to maturity in Christ, that's Colossians 1.28, a phrase I love, maturity in Christ, why did he do that? Because he knew that children, as in those who are immature, will never be able to stand against, I'm going to borrow from Ephesians 4 here, they will never be able to stand against the winds of opposing doctrine or against the craftiness of human schemes. That if a congregation is not properly equipped, then their works of ministry that they undertake will be doomed or at the very least, reduced in effectiveness. And therefore he made it a priority to admonish and teach everyone in all wisdom through the repeated... Here, 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 let, me, let me go to Colossians 1.28 for you. What was his priority? To admonish and teach everyone in all wisdom through the repeated proclamation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, here it is, that we may present every man perfect, this, can, this, this word here can also use mature, and I really like mature, but each man perfect in Christ Jesus. That means grown up. The preaching of the scriptures is the food which takes a, a neophyte Christian and makes him a strong, walking with the Lord Christian, who can then go out and do ministry and stand strong no matter what buffets him, and knows what fruit to look for, and knows, more importantly, what true fruit looks like, and knows how to separate it from false fruit, and knows how to persevere, and knows how to engage, and knows how to shine the light of, of, the, of the Savior, Because the more that Christians come to know Jesus, the more they are made like him. And the more that they are made like him, the greater they are able to shine his light into a world that so desperately has need of it. So this all begins with, and is sustained by, preaching. Is that still the way it is? Well... Back in 1971, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones began a series of lectures at Westminster Theological Seminary in the United Kingdom. And he started by asking this very same, very rhetorical, incidentally, question. He said this, quote, Is there any place for preaching in the modern church and in the modern world, or has preaching become quite outmoded? The very fact that one has to pose such a question and consider it is, it seems to me, the most illuminating commentary on the state of the church at the present time, close quote. He went on to say that as preaching wanes, which of course it was, even in 1971 and had been, and continues to this day, as preaching wanes, what the church sees is a, a shifted emphasis. As preaching wanes, the liturgical portions of the service are therefore emphasized, or elements of entertainment come in to replace it, or the giving of testimonies come in to replace it, or even personal counseling. All these things increasingly rush in to fill the void left if the preaching is weak or missing entirely. The centrality of the pulpit, he says, is both physically and theologically pushed aside. 
And even in 1971, he said that he had heard from preachers who wondered if it might not be better just to make a clean break from all of this tradition that they had inherited. Unbelievable. Now certainly this trend was not confined solely to the United Kingdom of 50 years ago. Nor has it stopped. It is in fact alive and well and continuing its devilish undermining of the church here in our country as well. In a recent study of mainline Protestant churches in southern Ontario, for example, it was found that among shrinking congregations, only half of the overseeing clergy agreed that the Bible is the word of God and is therefore reliable and trustworthy. Only half of them. That same half also agreed, or, uh, only half of them rather, agreed that it is very important to encourage non-Christians to become Christians, which is um, evangelism. Yes? Now, on the other hand, those are churches that were shrinking. So, on the other hand, the research showed that in churches that were growing, two thirds of the clergy agreed with the statement only those who believe in and follow Jesus Christ will receive eternal life. So, 66% agreed with that, but 100%, they unanimously agreed that the conversion of non Christians was very important. 100%. You must come to Christ. Hooray for small victories. In other words, if you look at this, uh, this research just on grounds of statistical observation, churches that hold on to traditional beliefs see growth, and those that do not, decline. Theologically, however, what this survey shows us, or rather what this survey, survey affirms for us, is that the church which remains the pillar and the foundation of the truth is the house of the living God. 1 Timothy 3.15 Christ is in the midst of a church like that, and he therefore builds it up. But the church that fails to carry out this biblical mandate, that church declines, and it continues to decline until it eventually, and, and let me say quite correctly, has its lampstand removed. So, this data may give us some hope, yes? It, it, it looks as if there are some churches in Canada that are remaining steadfast. But let me temper that this morning. All is still not well. There is good reason to believe that the growth experienced by many of these churches is actually not, despite their unanimous uh, acclamation of it, is not coming from new converts joining, but rather it's coming from people transferring out of other congregations. What's happening is that there are people in churches that are not adhering to sound doctrine. They don't like it. They are gravitating to churches where they are being properly spiritual fed, that are holding up to sound doctrine. So we see a church decline over here, and we see a church grow over here. And this trend, incidentally, extends into church plants as well. The man named uh, Jared Siebert wrote a book a number of years ago specifically focusing on church planting in Canada. He, he has this to say, we have lost, quote, we have lost much of our capacity to invite average Canadians into the good news life we say we believe in, close quote. In other words, we have stopped telling non-Christians what a joy it is, what a saving joy it is to have renewed and eternal life in Christ. Add to this the findings of a 2017 joint study between the Angus Reid Institute and a group called Faith in Canada 150. They were, they were brought together for Canada's 150th birthday. They did a joint study, and that study seems to affirm this. In that study, they were able to basically slot Canadians into one of four broad categories in terms of faith. We have non-believers. They don't believe in anything at all. That's 19%. We have the spiritually uncertain. These are skeptics. There may or may not be some kind of God out there. I don't know. That's 30%. Then we have, among people who are regular, um, who are regularly religious is the term they said, we have the privately faithful. That's 30%. And then we have the religiously committed. They're 21%. Now the group that I would have you put your particular focus on right now is this 30%. The privately faithful. Now, by the definitions of the poll, these are people who believe in life after death, they believe in heaven, they believe in hell, they believe in an act of God, and 
Most of them pray regularly to a higher power. This is not just a, a Christian survey. This is all faiths survey. So most of them regularly pray to a higher power. However, relatively few of them attend religious services or publicly talk about their faith. So in other words, only half of all Canadians, about 51%, only half of all Canadians have any kind of religious commitment whatsoever. And more than half of those prefer to keep what they believe to themselves. And this trend is further bolstered by findings of the same study that only 29% of religiously committed people in Canada view evangelism positively. That number drops to 8% of all Canadians who share that view. Evangelism is actually, in the, in the majority of views, a negative thing. Now, while that poll deals only with religious views and beliefs in general, I mean, we can doubt, doubtless apply that to the, Canadian, to, the, to the Christian church in particular. So on top of that study, let me, let me present this. A 2019 Barna study group. This one is going to floor you. This is a 2019 report that came up with this finding. 47% of practicing Christian millennials, so these are young adults, into their, uh, let's say, early 30s, I think some of the millennials are now. 47% of Christian millennials said, quote, it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hope that they will one day share the same faith, close quote. So 47% of practicing, professing Christian millennials have a negative view, don't think it's right to evangelize. Now that is despite the fact that 96% of these same young men and women said that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus. And that when someone comes to them with questions about their faith, 86% of them say they know how to respond. What is with the disconnect? In an attempt to offer some explanation for this paradox, a young woman at Boston University, her name is Rachel Gilson, she works with the student body, she, uh, she tried to answer it this way. She said that her students were, quote, highly aware of the vision of the 19th century white man who goes to Africa or Southeast Asia and doesn't just share the gospel, but also tries to force these people to be Europeans. They want to be as far away from that as possible, close quote. So, it's not so much that nearly half of Christian millennials are ashamed of the gospel. It's just that they feel presenting it with an aim towards conversion is both archaic and oppressive. And since they are the generation that stands to inherit the leadership of the church, barring some kind of direct intervention, this statistical slide is not going to show any kind of reversal. So let's take all this together. What picture gets painted? A Canadian church wrestling over how to carry out its divinely given evangelistic mandate in a way that remains as inoffensive and as culturally sensitive as possible. It's progressively losing its appetite to declare the praises of him who calls men and women to come out of the darkness and into the light. And it demonstrates, I'll borrow this term from Siebert once again, it demonstrates a dangerous apathy toward its own testimony. Simply put, evangelism in Canada has an image problem. Now, any discussion of just how and when these attitudes crept into and became so prevalent in the church ultimately has to boil down to one conclusion. That the current Canadian view of evangelism has been learned. From those who display such a domineering, scalp-hunting zeal that they have convinced an entire generation that the kindest thing they can do for their neighbor is to not share the faith, to those who de-emphasized gospel preaching to such a degree that their congregations don't know what it looks like 
and now also consider it an unimportant pursuit. From one extreme to the other, the contemporary view of evangelism has been shaped by preachers. Lloyd-Jones said, all of this is fully confirmed in church history. Is it not clear, as you take a bird's eye view of church history, that the decadent periods and eras in the history of the church have always been those periods when preaching has declined, close quote. To put it in another way, if the pupils are learning and taking away bad lessons, does the fault not lie with those who were tasked with teaching them correctly? As the pulpit goes, so goes the church. Therefore, if the church is in trouble, the blame lies in the pulpit. What then is the remedy? From, from where does correction start? How do we get the church, and the ministers in particular, but how, how, do, how do we get the church to start evangelizing again? Quote, what is it that always heralds the dawn of reformation or a revival? It is renewed preaching. Not only a new interest in preaching, but a new kind of preaching. A revival of true preaching has always heralded the great movements in the history of the church. Close quote. So if the Canadian view of and passion for evangelism is ever going to be properly reclaimed, it must begin with the setting of a proper example. It must be reflected in men who get serious about the solemn charge to center their ministry on preaching and through that do the work of an evangelist. So, first and foremost, the centrality of the sermon must be re-established. Preaching is the primary task of the church, and this is corroborated, as we outlined a few minutes ago, not only by her history, but by the scriptures as well. Look, just consider, for example, all the churches that get planted over the course of Acts. Each and every one of them begins with men arriving in a place that has not yet heard the good news, so they proclaim the good news, and then they let the Spirit of God do His work in the hearts of the hearers. To not put preaching, and evangelistic preaching at that, as the heart of your ministry, is like trying to mount a production of Hamlet without casting the lead role. Look, everything else may be stunning, the costumes, the music, the sets, and people may in fact even come, and they may see, and they may keep coming. But no matter how beautiful the stage is, even the best of these peripheral elements will never be able to hide the fact there is a glaring vacancy center stage. Which brings us to the second point. Not any kind of preaching will do. The preaching at the center of the church must be centered around Christ. He, he must, as it were, be the center of the center. Nominal, ear-scratching messages that are so prevalent in the contemporary churches today. They are simply too insubstantial to properly equip. They will never transform babes into mature Christians. They will never help milk drinkers grow into meat eaters. 20 minute long sermonettes and pep talks are not what the flock needs. In how many churches has sound doctrine been replaced by sound checks? And the Drama of redemption replaced by just plain drama. That's the norm now. That's what's so prevalent. But because that is so prevalent, in an almost ironic turnaround, if pastors and church planters and leaders of established congregations 
really want to come up with a new way, I mean, you hear this buzzword all the time, with a new way of doing church, if they really want to come up with something new, they are actually best to return to the old ways. Because the pendulum has now swung so far in one direction that to bring it back in the opposite direction is actually seen as a radical innovation. I know at Liberty there are some of you who came to join us at the invitation of people in the congregation, and I know it, 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 it chokes me up, it, it, it makes me so happy to hear. It's, it's such a, a wonderful affirmation. I know that some of you came at the invitation, and, and you, your invitation was simply this. You've got to come hear this guy preach. You've got to come hear this guy preach. Listen, I'm not doing anything new. I'm not trying interesting new ways to get your attention. I, I'm not crafting interesting new messages to speak into your situation and your season or whatever else. I am just trying week after week, to do the exact same thing that Paul called Timothy to do, to preach the word. I'm not telling you anything new or innovative. But because you haven't heard that in past decades, it seems new and innovative, right? Look, when you are surrounded by a sea of entertainment, exposition will naturally stand out like a rock island. And so it is to this end that, as Steve Lawson said, I'm going to quote him at length here because he says it far better than I ever could, quote, all pulpits must passionately declare Christ to be the eternal Son of the living God, the only Savior of sinners. All preaching must boldly announce Him as the reigning Lord of heaven and earth. He must be fearlessly announced as the one before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. All preaching must assert that Jesus is the final judge of every human life. Every preacher must proclaim the full counsel of God. Every doctrine in scripture must be delivered. Every truth must be taught. Every sin must be exposed. Every warning must be issued. And every promise must be offered. If God is to bless our preaching, the supreme majesty of Jesus Christ himself must be expounded in our sermons. All the lines of our preaching must intersect at this highest pinnacle, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Close quote. What he means to say, what Paul means to say, what every faithful minister means to say, is that every sermon that declares Christ is intrinsically, to some degree, evangelistic. J.I. Packer said, you cannot present the Lord Jesus Christ as the Bible presents him, that is, as God's answer to every problem in the sinner's relationship, and not, in effect be evangelistic all the time, close quote. Spurgeon, we haven't heard from Spurgeon for a long time in this, in this congregation. While he was teaching a, a college of young preachers, Spurgeon unashamedly told his students this, quote, it is a noble work. It is a noble work to instruct the people of God and to build them up in their most holy faith. We may by no means neglect this duty. To this end we must give clear statements of gospel doctrine, of vital experience, and of Christian duty, and never shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God." Close quote. It is expository preaching, explaining preaching, that takes sufficient time to explain and apply a selected passage of scripture so that it can be understood and embodied by the congregation of hearers. That does so much more to grow a church than does any strategy conceived by men. 
Now naturally, depending on the specifics of the text involved, some sermons will, some, some sermons must carry a, a heavier gospel emphasis than others. And so preachers, I mean, if, listen, if you're lucky enough to be doing more than one service a week, God bless you. So if you've got multiple services in a week, maybe one of those should be more evangelistic than the others, more directly evangelistic. If you're still only meeting once, once on a Sunday, there will be natural times in the, in, the, in the church calendar, for example. Christmas, Easter, listen, if you're not preaching the gospel at Easter, I don't know, just quit. Just please go find something else to do. There, there are these natural points of higher, more direct evangelistic appeals. And, and you know, these have been so mishandled. These, these kinds of direct messages. We, we need to confess that. We need to look at that this morning as well. These have been so badly mishandled in the decades past, in contemporary times. It's, it's the mishandled direct evangelistic messages that have convinced an entire generation of future Christians and church leaders that silence is actually the more humane option. So we need to be extra clear. It is not wrong to preach with an aim to conversion because doing the work of an evangelist is part and parcel of the preacher's mandate. If a pastor is truly following after the great shepherd, then he also yearns to see those who are lost saved. And if Christ is truly at work in that man in the pulpit, then woe to him, as much to him as it was to Paul, woe to him if he preach not the gospel. So that's not wrong. Preaching for conversion is not wrong. What is wrong, however, and the thing that the millennials are correct to chafe at, is the kind of shallow, numbers-driven, emotionally manipulative, air-quote evangelism. You know the type. The TV, the, the American TV megachurch evangelism that produces, at best, a superficial conversion and a superficial conviction. To use a more, more popular parlance, it is wrong to preach for decision. Because the fact both realistically and theologically, is that no one ever decides for Christ. Not of their own volition, not of their own will. For there are none righteous, none who understand, and none who seek after God. If a person seeks, it is because the Holy Spirit is already at work in them convicting them of their sin, making clear their enmity towards God, driving them to seek the means by which they can be reconciled to the Father. Do we know the Pilgrim's Progress? I mean, it used to be one of the most famous Christian works out there. It's uh, sadly disappointing how many people aren't familiar with it now. The Pilgrim's Progress. In that, Pilgrim, burdened with a heavy load, early in the story, meets evangelist. Let me, let, let, let me tell you about that meeting. Let me quote that meeting from John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. Now I saw upon a time when he was walking in the fields, this is Pilgrim, that he was, as he was wont, reading in his book and greatly distressed in his mind. And as he read, he burst out, as he had done before, crying, what shall I do to be saved? I also saw that he looked this way and that way as if he would run. Yet he stood still, because, as I perceived, he could not tell which way to go. I looked then, and saw a man named Evangelist coming to him, and asked, this is Evangelist, he says, Wherefore dost thou cry? Pilgrim answered, Sir, I perceive by the book in my hand that I am condemned to die, and after that to come to judgment, and I find that I am not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Then said Evangelist, Why not willing to die, since this life is attended with so many evils? 
Pilgrim replies, because I fear that this burden that is on my back will sink me lower than the grave, and that I shall fall into Tophet. And, sir, if I be not fit to go to prison, I am not fit to go to judgment, and from thence to execution. And the thoughts of these things make me cry. Then said Evangelist, If this be thy condition, why standest thou still? Pilgrim answered, Because I know not whither to go. Then he, that is Evangelist, then he gave him a parchment roll, and there was written within, it was written on this, these words, Fly from the wrath to come. Pilgrim therefore read it, and looking upon Evangelist, very carefully said, Whither must I fly? Then said Evangelist, pointing with his finger over a very wide field, Do you see yonder wicked gate? The man said, No. And then Evangelist said, Do you see yonder shining light? Pilgrim said, I, I think I do. Then said Evangelist, Keep that light in your eye, and go directly there too. So shalt thou see the gate at which thou knockest. What is the light? What's the faithful church, isn't it? It's the collective body of all of those who reflect Christ. Follow that, that beacon, that lighthouse, and you will, in its midst, find the gate, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Knock, and it will be opened. No one decides. It is a fallacy to let them think otherwise. The sinner does not decide for Christ. The sinner flies to Christ as their only hope and refuge. Preach that Preach to that effect. Pray for that reception. Whatever appeal the Savior has to them comes from the truth, capital T, the truth of the message preached. And so the best and only thing that an explicitly evangelistic sermon can do is lead those who hear it to see that Christ is their only hope and their only lifeline. How do we improve the state of evangelism in our country? How do we reclaim the passion for evangelism that we once had? We turn to Christ. O oh, leaders of the people of God, we turn to Christ. We proclaim Christ because Christ alone is the agent of evangelism. Christ alone is the faithful explanation and application of the gospel message. He is where all gospel roads lead. Proclaim him boldly unapologetically, biblically, and fulfill your ministries.